What is up, everybody? My name is Matt Cordova. I'm the senior pastor here at The River, and we are excited that you are listening to our podcast. Now, before the message starts, there's three things that we would love for you to do. One, we would love for you to share it. Two, we would love for you to subscribe. And three, we would love for you to go and rate it. So the message is about to begin. I hope it encourages you, and I hope that you know that God has a plan for your life. a series called spring training spring training any baseball people baseball we raise our hand don't be ashamed we're in church ain't no reason to be afraid Yo, some people are like, we're in Panhandle. What's baseball? Okay, listen, you're missing out on one of the greatest sports in history, right? You're missing out on great sports in history. In spring training, it's this time of year that spring training happens, and each organization brings all of their players together, and what they're going to do is play a bunch of games to prepare for the next season because the season is right around the corner. What we're doing, why we've called this spring training, is we are preparing for the battles that are coming our way, right? Last week we talked about this, that we know that the battlefield, the biggest battles that we face happen in the battlefield of our mind. Happens in the battle of our, many of the battles that we face, many of the struggles that we go through started here before they ever started taking place around us, you know? And here's what I believe. The invisible kingdoms you allow inside of here become the visible kingdoms that you see around you, right? Craig Rochelle said it this way. We quoted it last week that our lives are going in the direction of our strongest thoughts. So if we can learn where the battlefield is, learn how to fight these battles, then maybe the world around us would start looking a little bit different. How many of y'all are ready for a little bit different in our lives today? You know what I mean? Some of y'all, we need to be, we need to be ready for a little, go spend some time on Facebook and <laughs> you'll see it, right? It's bad. Like it gets rough. So if you got a Bible, open it up to 2 Corinthians chapter 10. We're going to start in verse 3. Um, I'll be real with you. I'm super pumped about today's message. While you're turning there, let me give you some information about this book, right? So the, Paul is, is the author of this. He's writing to the church in Corinth, and this is a corrective letter. Like, this isn't like, like Philippians. Philippians is like a very exciting, like, hey guys, I know I'm in prison. I'm suffering for the Lord. Thank you guys for sending that gift. This is not that kind of letter. This is kind of like, yo, you guys are messing up. There's some things you need to fix in the church, and we need to get it done. It's that type of letter, right? So let me tell you what's going on. So Paul, we know Paul plants this church, and he stays with them for about 18 months before he goes on to plant the new one. So Paul is deeply invested right here. You know what I mean? He's got relationships with these people. He spent time with these people. He's preached the gospel to these people. And he goes and he's doing what Paul does. Paul's the greatest missionary to walk the earth, right? So Paul is off planting churches. And all of a sudden, these people, they're called super apostles, right? That's how he'll mention them in the letter. These super apostles come in the church and they start to discredit Paul. They're like, listen, Paul, you know, he may have came and planted this, but we're more credible than Paul. Like, we're better speakers than Paul. Paul wasn't a great speaker. There's a story in Acts where Paul preaches and a kid falls out the window, dies, and they had to bring him back to life. Like, that's a true story. Paul, he either was a slow speaker or the dude was long-winded. But it, it didn't matter if he died in his message, he was going to bring you back to life. Holy Spirit inside of him. Come on, somebody. Right. But they're like, I, Paul, we're more credible than him. We're better speakers than him. And this, we are more spiritual than him. So he may have been the one to plant the church, but we are just all around better apostles than Paul. Now, before we read our text, how many of y'all, like, can you imagine the thoughts that would go through our heads if we were Paul? You know what I mean? Like, you plant this church, and all of a sudden, somebody comes in and takes it over, and they're, like, discrediting you. They're like, listen, we hear the Lord better. It's like the whole comparison thing. I pray in tongues, but you just you just give hugs. You know what I mean? I'm more spiritual than you. That's not how it works. Right? How many of y'all would be ticked? Like, just show of hands. You'd be ticked if somebody came in and discredited you. Well, let's look at the, let's look at the Bible and let's see how Paul says we should respond. Uh, chapter, chapter 10, verse 3 says, For although we live in the flesh, we do not wage war according to the flesh, since the weapons of our warfare are not of the flesh, but are powerful through God for the demolition of strongholds. We demolish arguments in every proud thing that is raised up against the knowledge of God. And we take every thought captive to obey Christ. Take every, 
thought captive to obey. Here's what I want to talk about. I want to talk about how to fight. I want to talk about how to fight these battles. Everybody turn to neighbor and say, it matters. It matters. It matters how we fight. Let's pray. So dear and Father God, man, we just thank you for today. God, we thank you that there's no more snow and it's 80 degrees outside. Hallelujah. God, and we ask that you would come and, and you would give us strength in our minds, that your spirit would strengthen our thought life. God, we love you. It's in your name we pray. And everybody said, amen. It matters how we fight. Um, if you've, if you've been here for some time, you guys have probably got to see, we have, me and Alexis, we have two, uh, amazing little boys. One of them looks like Pat Mahomes. Now, I mean, for real. And that's what he, if you tell him, hey, who's your haircut look like? It's Pat Mahomes. He has a Pat Mahomes t-shirt. But for some reason, when he gets older, he wants to play for the Seahawks. It doesn't make sense to me, but that's, that's Bradley. And then, you know, we've got another little bubbly. Um, he's about to be 11 months old, little boy named Juju. And Juju's going to throw anything that you give him. That's, that's our, those are our boys. Uh, I want to talk about Bradley for a little bit this morning. I love, man, Bradley, Bradley is a character. If you spent some time with Bradley, Brad, I, I call him this. It's so true. Bradley is a tornado with a mouth. Like the homie talks a whole bunch. And if you go into a room after him, it's destroyed. Like completely, it's gone. Um, but me and Bradley, there's one of the things, one of the things that we love to do is we like to play Nintendo Switch. Anybody got a Nintendo Switch at your house? They are from the Lord. Listen, I'm telling you, Holy Spirit's telling me, telling you through me, go buy it. No, don't do that. Anyways. We have a Nintendo Switch, and one of our favorite things to do is there's a game that came out when I was a kid that's on the Nintendo Switch, and it's awesome. It's called Super Smash Bros. Super Smash, and, and this is what Super, it's, it's like, it's a violent game, but not very. Let me explain. You're like, you're letting your four-year-old play a violent game? Don't you judge me, okay? Um, this is what, it, it takes all of the characters of the Mario world, and you fight to knock each other off the platform. Like, it's super cool. Mario shoots the little fireballs. Yoshi, like, eats people. That's weird, but, you know, that's what happens. So we love to play Super Smash Bros. And, and Bradley likes to invite his friends over, and they'll come over. And now, when his friends come over, they, like, both run up to me, like, Matt, can we play Super Smash Bros? And I'm like, yes. But there was, there was one day that Bradley was like, hey, Dad, can we play Super Smash Bros? He had a friend come over, and his friend goes, Bradley. Who's better at Super Smash Bros? You or your dad? Oh. Bradley goes, oh, it's me. I kick my dad's butt. I'm like burning, like fuming. All of a sudden, this like ray. There, there are times, listen, this is the rule in my house. There are no free victories, okay? Listen, you don't, you don't teach your kids nothing by letting them win. They got to know what it feels like to lose to know what it feels like to win. You know what I'm saying? Like, not everybody's a winner. I don't care what the world says. So there's a time, oh, there's a time that Bradley did truly beat me, and I hate this question. Ugh, I hate it. He goes, Dad, I won. How did I do that? And I'm like, I don't know, son. Maybe you push the right button at the right time. You know what I mean? Like, it makes me, how did I do that? Go to bed. You're done with it. <laughs> done. I'm sick and tired of it. But this day, he goes, oh, I'm way better than, I can kick my dad's but, and I'm like, oh, it's going down. It's going, woo. Uh, if targeting was a penalty in video games, you know what I'm saying? So we play, and I straight up, I let him have it. Like, I'm going after him. I mean, he was the first one to lose every round. And then he comes up to me, uh, and he goes, Dad, why don't you let me win? And, and I remember telling him this conversation. I said, it was easy for you to talk trash before we started playing. I said, if you're good at something, you don't need to tell anybody. You just show them by how you play the game, right? If you're good at something, you don't got to run your mouth. You show them by how you play the game. See, that was instilled by in, in my life by my parents. You guys have heard, we, we grew up, we got to travel the country, but mostly playing baseball. Baseball was kind of our sport. We got to go to play at nationals and all that other stuff. There was a couple rules in, in our household that, that I value. One is you weren't allowed to taunt. You don't showboat, right? That's not like this generation. Everything, they do something, they flex. Like, ugh. I'm like, dude, my calves' sons are bigger than your biceps. Put them away. Put them away, right? And, 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 but they, they, this generation loves to taunt. They love to showboat. They like to, to run their mouth. Another thing that we weren't allowed to do was to talk to the refs. 
If the ref made a bad call, we weren't allowed to address them. We weren't allowed to give them dirty looks. We were just supposed to play the game, and we were supposed to let our coach do that. Why? Because it matters how you play the game. It matters how you... See, here's the thing. That same thing translates to how we fight our battles, right? It matters. Listen, we do not represent ourselves. We need to understand that. The Bible says that when we said yes to Jesus, we died to ourselves and we carry our cross. It's one of the hardest things in the world is to not choose you, but to choose him 100% of the time, especially when there's a battle in our mind or we know that somebody's saying something against us. Right, But the Bible tells us, no, we die to ourselves. Sometimes, oh, this is tough. Sometimes being a Christian is surrendering your right to fight back. Sometimes, it stinks. Because what we need to do is we need to ask, is, does the end result lead people to Jesus? If I fight back, it, it, you know, there's some people in this world that all they want to do is fight. They bring up a problem not to find a solution. They want to complain. They want to fight. Those people exist, right? So all we're going to do is waste time, energy, and effort addressing those problems. There are some times when we speak up, and it's going to end with God in the middle, uh, at the end. And before we engage those arguments, that's what we need to ask the question is, hey, is this going to point people to God? You know what I mean? Is this going to point people to God? So let's, let's think about Paul for a little bit. Paul plants this church, and it seems like his congregation has bought in to what these guys have came in and started saying. They've, they've, they've bought in that these guys are more credible. They've bought in that these guys are uh, better speakers. They've bought in that these guys are more spiritual because they talk about visions and revelations. They even bought in the fact that one of the arguments is that Paul lives fleshly. I think if we were to read Paul's letters, we know that's not true. I mean, who else is signing up to go to prison so that the gospel can be advanced? You know what I mean? Nobody? Nobody? Ain't none of us locked up. <laughs> you know? So, so what are some thoughts that might be going through Paul's head? I think if I was Paul, I'd be ticked. Like, realistically, I'd be furious. Come on, guys, like after all that I've done for you guys. Oh, I can't wait till I see y'all again. You think my letters are mean? Wait till I see you face to face. You know what I mean? Wait till I show up. Oh, I'm bold here. You want to see how bold I could really be? Arrogant. Paul could be arrogant. Arrogance could be going through. You know what? Listen, if that's how you're going to be, you're not really worth my time anyways. It was a waste of my time for me to show up and plant that church. These are real thoughts that he could have had. On the other side of it, he could feel rejected. Come on, guys. After all I did for you, how could you turn on me? How could, how could, you, how could you believe them so easily? He could feel lost. Man, I thought we were tight. What, 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 am, I supposed to, what am I supposed to do? Where do I go from here? Or hopeless. I guess that's just how it's going to be. Maybe question his leadership, man, maybe I'm not the leader that God called me to be. Cause they, they gave, they turned on me so quick. They left so fast. Anybody resonate with any of these? You know what I mean? It's kind of crazy because Paul was a human just like us. He may have wrote two thirds of the New Testament, but he had the same temptations that we face, especially in our minds, especially in our minds. What I love is Paul teaches us how to handle it. So in verse 3, look at this. He says, although we live in the flesh, we don't wage war according to the flesh. Did y'all see that? Though we live in this world, we don't wage war according to the flesh. We don't wage war like this world does. Let me, let me explain the flesh. So you heard that one of his accusations is that Paul lives fleshly. Here's the easiest way to define what the flesh looks like when the Bible talks about the flesh. When you, when somebody says you live by the flesh, what they're saying is you live only to please you. There's a constant battle. Paul will talk about it in the book of Romans about the flesh versus the spirit. 
If I'm leaving, if I'm living by the Spirit, I'm living to like it from this place of the pleasure of God, but I'm letting the Spirit of God push and transform and guide my life. Does that make sense? But if I'm living for the flesh, what he's saying is that if I live for the flesh, all I'm doing is I'm making decisions that are all about me. That's what, I mean, the original sin was, right? It was selfishness. It's about me. I want to do what makes me happy. I want to live for me. So they're accusing him of living for himself. He says, listen, though we live in the flesh, though we live in this moment where it could be just about us, we don't fight like everybody else does. We need to understand that as Christians, we don't wage battle like the world does. Man, if we could go back to 2020, how many of us would do that different? Listen, if we could go back to 2020 and delete Facebook <laughs> or CNN or any other news or Fox News, how many of us would live it different? You want to talk about playing mental games? The, guy, the, the devil had a, a heyday with Christians getting us to focus on the political stance on COVID and all this other stuff. So we ran around terrified instead of running to the book of life where God was. This was the, that was the greatest opportunity for us to stand on an unshakable kingdom. That's what the Bible says about the kingdom of God. It is an unshakable kingdom. While Christians were like walking around like it was leg day. You know what I mean? We're shaking. Legs right. I'm about to fall. We were like that. Why? Because that's what we focused on. Paul will say this in Colossians. He says, set your eyes on the realities of heaven where Christ is seated at the right hand of the Father and think about heavenly things. Did you notice that order is super specific? Eyes, thoughts. Eyes, thoughts. Why? Because I think about what I'm looking at. I think about what I'm looking at. If I'm not looking at the King of Kings, listen, I'm not going to think about him. If the only time I think about God is on Sunday, it might be just because this is the time that we're talking about the Bible. And we've got to get the word of God in our life. We don't fight battles like the world does. Why? Because we don't represent the world. We represent the king of kings and his kingdom. And we're called to advance that here and now, people. We're called to advance his kingdom here and now. So going back to the original saying, that it matters how we fight. It matters how we fight. So what's really interesting is instead of attacking the people, Paul goes after their claims. He doesn't attack the, the, the super apostles. He'll quote them by calling them super apostles, but he doesn't attack them. He goes after their claims. He goes after the, the arguments that they've made, right? We need to understand. I want to say this before we move on. Just because we exist in this world doesn't mean that we behave like the world. Just because we live, you know why? You, you want me to tell you who? Mm, you know why you live here? To be a light. You, you know why you didn't go to heaven as soon as you said yes to Jesus? Because if you step outside these walls, it's still super dark. Jesus was telling a, a beat down, oppressed, broken group of people in the Sermon of the Mount, hey, you are the light of the world. A city on a hill. Nobody lights a light and puts it underneath a basket. You know what's happened for Christians here in America? The church buildings become our basket. We like to shine bright in here, but the crazy thing is this is a room full of lights while the world's dark out there. This is where we strengthen our light, and then we go out there, and we go and we show people who God is by how we live our life. Right? What does the Bible say? You are God's masterpiece, created anew in Christ Jesus for the good works that he prepared for you. You're his masterpiece, but you were also created for good works. You were created for good works. Why? Well, he would tell you at the end of that, let your, you're the light of the world, to let your good deeds shine so that people will see them and glorify God. If the only time you use good works is in the church, you're using them in a place that's already lit up. You're supposed to use your good works out in the world. Why? So people see who God is. The way you fight your battles could be a good work. The difference is, do you fight it your way or God's way? Do you fight it your way or God's way? Paul, I told you, he doesn't attack the people. He attacks the claim. I think in our day and age, we see too many people attacking people. Too many Christians attacking those, uh, just uh, attacking each other. I think sometimes the greatest opposition to the church is the church. 
Christians, man, Christians are judgmental people. Woo-wee. At least I don't sin like they sin. Well, you just judge them, so that's kind of a sin like they sin. You know what I mean? Just like, you know, at least I don't do what I don't talk to my kids like they talk to their kids. But you're picking the bottle up on the weekend. You, you know why we like to judge each other? Can I be real? It makes us feel better about ourselves. Insert living according to the flesh. Ooh, let's get to the good stuff. <laughs> All right, here's what we do. We're going to fight different. We got to fight different. We gotta, everybody turn to your neighbor and say, we got to fight different. Everybody turn to your second choice and say, it matters. It matters. How do we do that? Paul's going to give us two ways. Okay, two ways. I want you to write these down. The first one is you attack the stronghold. Attack the stronghold. Why do you attack the stronghold? Because the cross was for us to be unified. We need to understand that. One of the, the byproducts of this, of sin in the very beginning was that now all of a sudden humanity who was once unified is now accusing each other. E- evidence of this. As soon as sin happens, God shows up on the scene. Adam goes, that woman that you gave me. First of all, I'm not calling my wife woman and I'm not blaming God. But he said, it's her fault and it's yours for giving her to me. You know what I mean? So he blames her, he blames God. For the first time in history, in that moment, humanity stood against each other. So what did the cross do? It brought us back together. It was unified. So why does Paul not attack the people but attack the claim? Because we're not called to fight against people. The uh, consistent theme throughout the Bible is that the, the war, our battles are not against flesh and blood, right? How many people are quoting that scripture when somebody's talking about you? It's not against flesh and blood. It's not against flesh and blood. Your battle is not against the person who said something. It's the spirit behind why they said it. It's either anger or jealousy or whatever it is. That's where the battle is, right? As the church, no, we don't attack people. We fight for people. We stand beside people. We come alongside people. And if they're your enemy, listen, Jesus said you pray for them. Our job as the church is to fight for unity, We fight for it. Why? Because Jesus gave that to us at the finished work of the cross. That humanity would be unified under the name and the authority of Jesus Christ. That was something that was given to us. So why do we attack the strongholds? Because one is it allows us to stay unified. It allows us to stay unified. Listen, there's so many things in like in our church where we parent different, where we think different. Like we could bite each other to death. But the biggest thing that we have in common is that Jesus Christ is our Lord and Savior. And he's called us to live for him, not for us. If we can unify around that, everything else doesn't matter. You know what I mean? You parent your kids the way you parent your kids. I'll parent mine the way that I parent mine. But we're going to walk this life out together. How many of you understand we can disagree about something and move in the same direction? That's what we're called to do. So we attack the stronghold. We attack the stronghold, not the people. Verse 4. It says, since the weapons of our warfare are not of the flesh, but are powerful through God for what? The demolition of what? Of strongholds. The weapons that God gives us are powerful through God, not through you. They're powerful through God. It is God working through you for the demolition of strongholds. What does that do? What are, what are we demolishing? Every argument and proud thought, lofty thought, uh, that r- is raised up against the knowledge to, uh, uh, knowledge of God. Can y'all see where the caffeine's kicking in? Mm. <laughs> so what are the, okay, so in this text, we see two things. One, God gives us weapons, Right? What do we know about these weapons? They're not from me. They're not of me. In fact, the way that they work is powerfully through God. It's God working through me. Does that make sense? But this other, the other thing that, it, it, that we know is that these weapons are designed for a purpose. What is that? To demolish strongholds. To demolish strongholds. I'm going to read you something from the Tony Evans commentary. I love his definition of stronghold. He says, Paul isn't talking about physical fortresses, of course, but about destructive patterns of thought. Everybody say that with me. Destructive patterns of thought that lead people astray and hold them hostage to sinful and harmful addictive behavior. That's what Paul's talking about. He's talking about thought patterns that are destructive, that we continue to buy into, right? These ideas that these people have brought up against Paul, they're destructive. And because of that, because of their buy into these things, 
They're easily swayed. These people could be coming in and preaching a false gospel, or something opposite of what Paul taught them, something opposite of the truth. And they're going to follow them because they bought into destructive patterns of thinking. But let me ask this question. Have we done the same thing? Not maybe necessarily following false teachers, but in our life, do we have destructive, destructive patterns of thought? You know what I mean? Imagine... This is the way that we would have responded to Paul's situation. Is the way that we would have responded the right? Is it a destructive pattern of thought? Do we let anger take priority over God's way of handling it? See, I, I was sitting down and I was thinking about it this week. Um, this, if you were to poll this upcoming generation and ask them what are they like most focused on, what are they most aware of, this generation is more aware of mental health than any other generation. Right? Uh, I think I was talking with one of our elders one time, but, you know, back when, when I was growing up, anxiety and depression weren't really a thing. It was like you kind of had this emotion and you learned to work through it. You know what I mean? But now, um, and I'm not, I'm not saying it wasn't a thing back then. It just wasn't a defined diagnosis. Is that, is that a fair assumption? It wasn't a defined diagnosis. So growing up, anxiety, depression, stuff like that, you just, you muscled through it. You know what I mean? But for this generation, um, and what we're seeing is we're more mentally aware uh, as far as our health, mental health goes, than we've ever been. So thinking about that uh, and thinking about some of the fortresses we have in our life, there are uh, six of them that came to mind that I think are the most prominent or uh, most consistent. And I want to talk about these. Um, the first one is depression. The first... I think this is a big deal. Um, and I'm going to try to define it as simply as I can. I don't want to overlook it. But depression can be a stronghold in our life. Is depression real? Yes. We need to understand that. Depression is real, and we can't overlook, we can't oversimplify how easy it is to get over it, because it's not. Okay? Depression um, can be a stronghold in our life. And what I've seen about Depression is it's usually associated with a traumatic event in our past. People with depression, they're often, they often lose sleep. They often lose, ta- uh, like their hunger. They're often unmotivated. And a lot of times they could be still and paralyzed. Can you see the fortress or the stronghold? Um, anxiety could be a stronghold. Anxiety is a big one. Anxiety, the best way I can describe it is the fear of a future outcome. Imagine you're in a situation where maybe you've got a, um, a hard conversation you've got to have with somebody or you're afraid, like your boss sends you a text message like, hey, come meet me in my office. Some people, that gives them anxiety. I text my staff and I'm like, hey, listen, you're not in trouble. Come see me in my office. You know what I mean? But like for kids, for students, you got a big test coming up. Creates anxiety. Uh, the thought of, of your future creates anxiety. You know what I mean? Another one is worthlessness. Worthlessness can be a stronghold. It's the idea that I just exist. I'm not created for a reason. I just feel time and space. I'm never going to accomplish anything. It is what it is. And I just got to deal with it. A lot of times somebody struggling with worthlessness asks this question, why am I here? Why or why am I even here? You know what I mean? Um, feeling defeated can be a stronghold. Feeling dis- defeated is this idea of like, uh, I just feel like a failure. Like nothing I ever do comes to pass. Nothing ever works. Everything I put my hand to falls through the cracks. It fails. Nothing, nothing ever sticks. Um, another one. Feeling alone, loneliness. Loneliness could be a stronghold. It's this idea that, that nobody cares about you. You know what I mean? Or if they do, the reason that they care is less about who you are and more about what you do in their life. So people care about you for your gift, but not that you're a person. What's crazy is even if you're surrounded by people, you could feel alone. I, there's a, a Robin Williams quote that I hold on to when he, when he talked about loneliness. 
Robin Williams said, the worst thing isn't being alone. It's being surrounded by people who make you feel alone. I think that's the greatest definition of loneliness. Is being surrounded by people, but still feeling like you're by yourself. Another one. This is the last one I want to define is pride and arrogance. Pride and arrogance could be a stronghold. It's the idea, nobody's as good as me. Nobody's as gifted as me. Nobody knows like I do. Um, sometimes an easy way to define whether you operate out of pride or arrogance is if somebody's talking to you about their struggle and you've already got an answer before they finish tr- talking. It's I've already got an answer. I've already figured this out. Can you see, can you see where all of these could be strongholds in our life? Worship team, if you guys would come up. Can you see where all of these can pull us away from what God says is true? It's tough. Like, here's the the reality. Just like Peter talked about Satan being a real thing, we need to understand that Paul wouldn't talk about strongholds unless it was a real thing. You know what I mean? And this, here, think about this. Put this into perspective. This was written over 2,000 years ago. And it was just as real to them as it is to us now. And he tells us, this is encouragement. Man, we don't fight these battles that we know that are taking place in our mind. We don't fight them like everybody else. We can't fight them like everybody else. The cost is too big to fight them like everybody else. Okay, Paul, so what do we do? Well, this is what you do. You go after the strongholds. You need to understand that God has given you weapons that he uses in your life, that he uses in in your mind to fight the things that you're going through. You, you, you want to know what the biggest weapon is? Go look at Ephesians 6. You see the armor of God, right? The armor of God's amazing. Just to nerd out a little bit, every one of those armor references is a Isaiah reference, and they all point to the suffering servant who is Jesus. So essentially to put on the armor of God is to put on Jesus Christ. But if you want to look at the purposes of the armor, only one of those is offensive. Offensive, not offensive. Don't be offended. Offensive. And it's the Word of God. It's the Word of God. And he says it's like a sword. Here's why I love that analogy. If you don't know how to wield a sword and you step on the battlefield, guess what's happening? You're done. You're done. We live in a time where people don't know how to wield a sword. We live in a a time where people don't know how to navigate the sword. They don't know its weight. They don't know how it feels. They don't know how how it's distributed. And listen, I'm telling you the truth. The Bible could be confusing. It can be. In, In our How to Read the Bible class, one thing that we'll tell them is the Bible is best learned together. Even if you read it on your own, if you have somebody that you can ask questions, it teaches you more about your sword. You know what I mean? You don't learn to wield a sword on your own. No, you have an instructor. There's somebody that trains you. Usually there's a military commander that would be the one teaching you how to wield your sword. Right? We've got to learn to wield our sword. Why? So that we can learn to attack strongholds. So how do we do that? It's the second thing he says. He says, take your thoughts captive to obey Christ. Verse 5 says this. And we take every thought captive to obey Christ. Everybody read that with me. And we take every thought captive to obey Christ. We take every thought captive to obey who? Christ. Christ. You know what that means? Christ gets the final say so. Christ gets the final word. I don't know what you're going through or what you walked in with, but if Christ didn't get the final word, then you're living in a stronghold. God gets the final say. Why? Because he had the first say. 
He was the one that spoke you into existence. He was the one that put his hand to you and he formed you. He had the first word and he gets the last word. Too many of us are bought into the the lies and the deceptions and the slander of that lion. You know what I didn't tell you last week? Is that Bible says the devil is like a roaring lion. That means that he can only be one if you give him permission to. And too many people are giving teeth to a toothless cat. We're giving him too much, too much say so. We're giving him more authority in the words that come over our life, or we're giving other people more of the final say so in our life. Listen, teenagers, don't listen to what everybody's saying. Listen to God. I'm gonna tell you this as you get older, everybody's got an opinion, most of them are wrong. They are. You're never going to, listen, everybody, you will never please everybody. You won't. And as long as you try to, you're going to be everybody else's puppet. Giving everybody the final say. Some people are dancing around like NSYNC was in that song. (laughs) Because you're letting everybody else tell you who you are. You're letting everybody else define your moments. You're letting everybody else get the final say. And why you do that? The devil's just building this big old tower. He said, oh, I got you locked up. I didn't even have to do anything. I just let you listen to other people. I let you listen to the words everybody else says. <laughs> here's, here's the, this is, uh, I love this. You have a choice. Each and every one of us have a choice. This is our choice. We can either choose to dwell or live in the stronghold that's in our mind, or we can challenge it with God's word. You can can choose to live in what's going on here, or you can challenge it, take every thought captive, and see what Christ has to say about it. So we're going to end differently. There's a reason the lights are down. Can we turn the audio on the keys up just a little bit? Usually in church, what we do is I tell you what, like how to practice the thing. Today, we're going to do it. Today, if you walked in and some of these are your strongholds, I'm going to speak the word of God over your stronghold. I'm going to give you something to say so that we can walk it out. And the reason that we've got the lights dim is I don't want you to, you don't have to stand up. You don't have to raise your hand. But if this is your stronghold, I want you to hold your hands out like you're receiving something, right? Hold your hands out like you're receiving something because I'm going to speak the the, the truth over you. And I think God wants you to hold it. I think God wants you to receive it more than the lie. Too many of us have held our hands open for lies in our life. It's time for us to hold them up for God. Let God speak some truth into our life. So depression, depression. If we'll bring that one, that word up. Depression, usually associated with a past traumatic event. How many of you understand that many people in the Bible had depression? David had depression. But my favorite story with somebody that had depression was Elijah. Elijah, he wins this big old battle against these prophets. And then this queen comes and she says, listen, I'm going to, if you if you don't, like, I'm going to kill you tomorrow, basically. I'm going to kill you tomorrow. And he goes and he's depressed and he goes and he hides in a cave. And he says that he, like, he wanted to die. He had this major victory in this one moment, this one word spoken over him, this past experience that was traumatic to him where his life was threatened, made him want to go hide in a cave. And you know what God did? God let him sleep and he sent angels to take care of him. And then he starts showing up. And he says, listen, Elijah, he sends like a windstorm. This windstorm like separates the mountains. He says, but God wasn't there. And then there's an earthquake, and it says, but God wasn't there. And then a firestorm falls from the sky, it says, but God wasn't there. And then a small whisper. God speaks to him in his depression, just like he does you. He says, Elijah, why are you here? Why are you here? Paul would write the same thing to Timothy. Paul's about to lose his life, and Timothy's like a son to him. And you know what he tells him to do? Hey, Timothy, rekindle the gift inside of you. Rekindle the gift inside of you. 
See, here's what you need to understand, that if you were here with depression, you were not your past. You are not whatever the event that was that happened to you. It may not have been your fault. It may have been something that somebody else did to you, but that thing does not define you. You are not your past hurts. You are not your past struggles. You are not your past anything. You are exactly who God says that you are. And even in the middle of your depression, God shows up and he whispers and he tells you, hey, listen, I've got a plan for your life. I've got a purpose for your life. And I need you to rekindle that gift. And when you do, I'm going to be with you. I'm going to be with you where you go. So listen, if you, if you struggle with depression, here's what I would tell you. God's still with you. And he tells you to refire that gift inside of you. Because even though your past may try to hold you back, the gift of God inside of you wants to launch you forward. Anxiety. Anxiety. We see anxiety in Jesus, actually. Jesus is about to go to the cross. And he's in the Garden of Gethsemane. He's praying. And the Bible says that he was distressed, like so much to the point that like blood was coming from his pores. Anxious. Anxious maybe about the cross. Probably more anxious for that for the first time in his life. He's going to be disconnected from his father. Because he was going to carry the sin of the world. But you know what, you know what gave him joy in his anxiety was that he was still in God's will. The Bible says that for the joy set before him, he endured the cross, scorning its shame. See, there, there was the joy in him. He was still in God's will and he knew what he was dying for. Listen, I don't know what it is in your life that you're worried about, but I do want to know what the word of God says. In 1 Peter, the Bible says this, if you're anxious, cast your anxieties on the Lord. Cast them on the Lord. Now, there's a difference. Like, let's say that this is an anxiety. What we do is we're like, cast our anxiety on the Lord. And then we put it down, and then we pick it back up because we didn't put it on the Lord. We put it just on the shelf next to us. No, casting, sorry, tissue box, but casting is like, take it. Get rid of it. Cast your anxieties on the Lord. Why? This is the best part. Because he cares. That's what the word of God says. If you're anxious, whatever it is that you're anxious about that's in front of you, you need to know God cares. God cares. He sees your heart. He sees your struggle. And he wants to walk with you through it. I like what Paul says. He says that, man, we were doing ministry and it was more than we could handle. We thought we we thought we were going to die. He says, but God was with us. God is with us. And he'll do it again. God was. He is. He'll do it again. Listen, if you're struggling with anxiety, let me tell you something. God is with you. He has been with you. He will be with you. And he will do it again. He will. So cast your cares. Just throw them away. Give them to God. Why? Because he cares. Because he cares. Worthlessness. Man. If you struggle with worthlessness, I would tell you this. That you are made in the image and the likeness of God. And because of that, there's so much worth to you. In fact, if, if, if worth is determined by the price that somebody would pay, we need to understand that Jesus paid the highest price for you. That you were worth the Son of God to God. You know I mean, uh, even to dive even more into Scripture, you aren't just made in His image and this likeness, but in Psalms 139, it says that you were fearfully and you were wonderfully made. As if God took His time, it was super intentional with you. But it doesn't just stop there. The Bible says that God looks at the story of your life. And then it says that the thoughts about you that God has about you outnumber the grains of sand on the earth. So what would I tell you? Listen, God wasn't done with you when he made you. God still reads your story and he still thinks about you. You are full of worth because you were worth it to Jesus and he went to the cross for you. Don't let anybody tell you any different. Let God have the final say. And this is what God says. Listen, you were so worth it that I made you look like me. You're made in my image. You're made in my likeness. I put my hand to you. I'm the potter. You're the clay. 
Those people that have stuff to say, they didn't do anything. In fact, I made them too. If they only knew their worth, they wouldn't judge yours. You're worth it. Defeated. Feel like a failure. Feel like nothing you do ever works out. This is what James would say, consider it pure joy when you face trials of many kind. He says, because the testing of your faith produces perseverance. And when perseverance has finished its work, you'll be mature and complete, not lacking anything. When perseverance, listen, you know what perseverance is? Perseverance is the strength, the ability that God gives us through His Holy Spirit to keep moving forward even though we might fail. So here's what I would tell you. It may have stuck, not, it may not have stuck right now. It may not have worked yet, but don't you give up. God has put dreams inside of you. There's a reason that you keep trying and keep pursuing. And just because something didn't stick doesn't mean that God's finished. It doesn't mean that that one dream was the end all. No, keep dreaming, keep moving, keep pressing. Why? Because when my faith is tested, even though that there's a potential that this next dream could fail, my faith grows and my maturity grows in Christ. You're only defeated when you give it up. Too many dreamers have given up on the dreams that God's put inside of them because something else didn't work. Let me quote the great theologian Rocky. Life isn't about how hard you can get hit. It's about how many times you can get hit, get knocked down, and keep standing up. Wise man. Loneliness. I'm going to be a little transparent. This is my stronghold. Loneliness is the feeling that you could be surrounded by people and feel all by yourself. Let me tell you something. You're not alone. You're not alone. There are people that see you, not for what you do, but for who you are. Yeah, there's a gift inside of you. That is true. But you are a gift spoken by God to bless the community of believers around you. He says this. He says, don't stop gathering. Don't stop gathering. Listen, you become more alone when you hide. That's the truth. When you feel alone in the battle, it's often because we hide. And sometimes we, we hide within ourselves. We may be where people, but nobody knows the struggle that's going on. And we still feel alone. And this is the furthest from the truth. When we tell people, we can see the, that people are with us, that people are for us, that they're willing to pray with us, which is what he says. Don't stop gathering, but continue to meet to encourage one another. Listen, if you feel alone, you're not. You're surrounded by good people. You're surrounded by godly people. And the only reason, it's not the only reason, We've given too much truth. We feel alone because we give too much truth that we're just surrounded by people and they just want us for what we could do. Before you had a doing, you were a being. Before you had a doing, before there was a gift inside of you, there were, you're a being. And God's just telling you to be because there are people around you that see your being, not your gifting. You're not alone. You're surrounded. And you're loved. Last one. It's a little bit more on the different side of the spectrum. But pride and arrogance. If this is your stronghold, I would tell you this. You're not wrong to believe that you have a gift. But you're wrong when you elevate yourself over other people. You're not wrong to believe that you have a gift. But you're wrong when you elevate yourself over other people. Because this is what the Bible says. It says God opposes the proud, but he exalts the humble. If you struggle with pride and arrogance, sometimes the resistance that you see isn't anybody else but God trying to humble you. And the only reason that he would humble you is because he loves you. So what would I tell you? Just what Jesus and Paul would write. Consider others more important than yourself. Consider others more important than yourself. Just believe that you don't, like you're, you're not the bee's knees, right? <laughs> we'll just leave that for Jesus. 
What I would tell you is to use your gift, but use it to serve people. Use it to build people up. Use it to come underneath them. Because that's what humility is. Pride is, man, I'm the top dog and you're never going to get to me. Humility is, man, I know God's given me a gift, so let me show you how to walk in it. That's what Jesus did. He served, right? Was the opposite of proud. I'm going to ask our ministry team to come up. And if you were going through one of those, man, I hope that you heard a truth that you needed to hear today. If you're online and and that's you, I hope you heard a truth that you needed to hear today. But if you need more prayer over something, don't sit back and wait. Like that's what we do, right? We're family. We pray together. We laugh together. We cry together. Body, the Bible says if one part of the body's sick, the whole body's sick. But listen, we don't fight the way that the world fights. We fight by taking whatever it is that's going through my mind and saying, what does Jesus have to say about it? And then if it's not from God, you use the word of God like a battering ram and you start to destroy that bad boy. Why? Because you're a new creation representing a new kingdom. And that does not have right or a place in your heart. So dear Heavenly Father, God, we just thank you for today. God, I thank you that for every stronghold that tries to show its face in our minds, that you've given us a word to hold on to, that you've given us a truth to hold on to. So God, I pray that you would give us the just the desire to continually go after the strongholds in our minds. God, and as parents, I pray that you would give us the, the, the knowledge and the strength to go after the stronghold in our kids so that we could speak to them what you say about them. God, that we could reverse the the rise and the increase of anxiety and depression by declaring God's word. We believe that you could do that. It's in your name we pray. Hey, that's the message. I hope it encouraged you. I hope it inspired you. I hope that you know that God has a plan for your life. In fact, if you would like to join us as a part of our online campus and you would like to watch the video as it happens live, Go follow us on Facebook or YouTube by searching The River in Panhandle, Texas. Have an amazing week.